This is episode 21 with Norman Wolf and Francis Valentin. Welcome to the Futures Intelligent Leadership Flowcast. This is your host, Tyler Mongan. I am the president of Haku Global. This is a space for globally minded experts to dialogue about the future of leadership with a focus on the key question, how can leadership be more intelligent about futures? From this conversation, innovative wisdom, practical tools, and actionable insights emerge to help future-ready leaders thrive in an uncertain, complex, and exponentially changing world. Let's jump in to the dialogue. Aloha and welcome to this episode of the Futures Intelligence Leadership Flowcast. This is your host, Tyler Mongan, and today's co-guests are Norman Wolf and Francis Valentin. Francis is the founder and CEO of the Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab, which helps organizations and individuals to navigate the contemporary world of business. She works on issues related to the impact of exponential technologies, new business models, changing demographics, and a high impact work cultures to the new expectations of customers, the sharing economy, and social responsibility. Norman is the founder of Quantum Leaders. He has over 40 years working in a variety of organizations from Fortune 500 to technology startups. He's a leading voice of the emerging new business paradigm and is viewed as an expert in the area of leadership, strategy, change adoption, process improvement, and organization design. He sees an organization through a different lens and uncovers new possibilities for growth. Norman is the author of The Living Organization, which outlines what is required to elevate senior executive teams to new standards of performance. Let's listen to the dialogue. So aloha, Francis and Norman. Thank you both for joining me on this episode. And as always, I want to start with this key question of how can leadership be more intelligent about future or futures given uncertainty, complexity, and exponential change in the world? I'd like to start with Francis. Could you answer this from your perspective and your work? Okay, I think yeah, I look through the lens of education and also looking towards knowledge and, and how we adapt. And um, coming here from, you know, calling in here from Auckland in New Zealand, I think we're going through adaptation at an alarming speed, which has actually been really uh, progressive, but also has really defined what uh, leaders can be looking at. So we have a, a leader here in our country who's taken an empathy, kindness, fairness, equity uh, approach to leadership. And it's really resonated at a time when people are, are asked to behave in a way that's you know un unusual, um, including obviously lockdown. So I think we're actually seeing it come to life in this part of the world where an empathetic um, leader is actually really changing the futures and we're, we're moving away from some of the traditional characteristics of leadership. Great. Thanks, Francis. And Norman, from your perspective. We have actually been living in a, what people have called a VUCA, a volatile, uncertain, complex world, uh, an ambiguous world. I find it fascinating because the fundamental paradigm of how leaders are trained to think about running a business is based on predictability and control. And so they are really challenged to, to shift their way of thinking uh, to be able to adapt to uncertainty, to be able to adapt to rapid change and, and uh, complete unknown uh, of what's going to happen. Uh, this current situation, if, if nothing else taught us that we can't predict, uh, this is definitely, uh, people don't, I mean, the whole world is changing. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. So I, I absolutely agree, agree with Francis that we really need the ability to shift uh, what I call shifting the paradigm. And and if you think about what's going on in, in, in the world when key paradigms were shifted, like going from the world is flat to the world is round. <laughs> to, you know, there's a mo wonderful movie uh, called Galileo where, where you can see the challenges that he went through when he tried to establish that the earth actually revolved around the, the sun. Uh, you we're gonna face similar challenges to that. Look how many years it took for us to begin to accept that 
uh, quantum physics actually is a more accurate way of understanding the way the world works over Newtonian physics. And people for years still, I mean, it's a hundred years now plus, and we're still wrestling with what does that mean? And how do I think about the world? Is non-locality a reality and, and all of that. So yeah, I think, I think this question you raised, Tyler, is an absolutely critical one for leadership today. Yeah, we actually just not just expanding it a little bit more yeah. for me. We, we think of it here in the terms of a below the line and above the line. Yeah. And, and above the line is that sort of willingness to, to learn and be open to change, and below the line being fixed and not willing to learn or, or having to be right. And I think mm. the time of having to be right as a leader has gone. That actually mm. there, is, there is no right anymore. And, and, and to your point, Norman, you know, you know everything is, is so volatile and the need to be adaptable. Um, actually means you, you have to put aside some of the things you thought to be true and actually be presented with better data, better facts, better insights, and then be prepared that sometimes you have to almost relearn in, in this state of flux. And I think that's quite a challenge for people who learned a discipline and became experts in one discipline, particularly maybe in leadership, and then actually are now being challenged that some of those metrics that they were really hanging on to as being proof and evidence of great leadership have now been changed and eroded over time, and particularly in the, in the last six months. Yeah. You, know, times. you know, Francis, I, I, I totally agree, and I love that above the line, below the line concept, because, and, and if you think about it, you know, I in a leadership role, everybody turns to me and expects me to have the answers. So it's almost like the whole system is geared to force me to have to be knowledgeable to know, to, to plan for what's gonna come. And that, that one puts the leadership in untenable positions and two makes it very difficult for them to give up that sense of, I have to know. I, I mean, that's what they pay me for. My board expects me to do that. Yeah. My employees expect me to do that. And yet here we are as consultants and trainers and educators uh, trying to tell them, wait a minute, you don't, you, you can't know everything you're not supposed to know everything and, and that's kind of like really disorienting that that's mm. a that's a cognitive dissonance in a lot of ways um, yeah i think that's a really interesting point norman is uh is how well one is we're talking how this old leadership models aren't going to be maybe working as well in the future but at the same time we also have to look at the, the people the followers the employees and how they have certain expectations of leadership in the old model and then all of a sudden the leader shows up and says, wait, we're changing the model. <laughs> you know, we're going to be more empathetic and equitable. And I don't know what's right anymore, but you still should follow me. But a lot of people still have those old expectations. Yeah. Um, so how do you, Francis, how do you think, or, or Norman, how do you think we can deal with that? I think it's, a, it's actually having sort of a different horizons of time that we can, we can identify. Saying, you know, we, we might be able to lead and say, what do we do today, tomorrow, next week, next month? Because some of those things are going to be, required just to, to get people moving and get you know things resolved but then having a horizon that midterm which is saying in five years you know this is where we're going this is the direction we're heading and these are some of the levers of change that will shape us and, and they could be for example in, in in sort of contemporary context things like climate change or sustainability or people thinking about capital in different ways and then you have a longer term horizon and we always talk here about 50 years um, and in terms of a 50 horizon, what would you want to be your legacy? What would you want your sector to be known for in 50 years time? Uh, we have another influence in New Zealand, which is our Maori influence for indigenous people, which is a 500 year horizon, mm. uh, which is actually saying, you know, it's all about the planet and the environment. And I think that's a really important one here, particularly, we think very, very consciously about mm. you know, the natural environment and making sure that we don't pillage it um, for, for purely for profit. So I think it, it is about responding to the timeframes you can you can work in, but acknowledging that you've got a sort of a directional star that you're aiming for, but along the way you might pivot multiple times because there are you know many influences that will come along. I think in addition, I totally agree with you, Francis. I think those are absolutely uh, shifting the framework or the time frame and and thinking out much further uh, really does change how we approach. Uh, the challenges we face and the solutions we come up with. I think in addition to that, we also need to help leaders with some fundamental new skill sets. Uh, 
and, and, and in addition to helping the leaders, and I'll explain what skill sets I think they need, we also have to understand, as you pointed out, Tyler, that the, the people that they're working with also have to sort of, not sort of, have to be developed, and in, in not only developed in their technical skills, but in what I call their level of maturity. I mean, I can't, as a leader, it would be irresponsible for me to say, hey, I'm not gonna decide anymore, you decide. And, and they're not capable of it. I mean, mm -hmm. that would be like delegating into the void. That would be, uh, as I said, irresponsible. So I have to bring them up so I can include them in the decision-making process. Um, and, and back to the, the skill sets, I really think my wife is a, comes out of the improvisation world. She was in theater improvisation for years. Mm -hmm. And when we met over 20 years ago, I was in the process of uh, writing my book and, um, it, and it just dawned on me like, wow, here's a whole body of knowledge. People have been trained to deal with uncertainty in a very specific way mm -hmm. to make things work right. What if we took that body of knowledge and used it to train leaders to think from an improvisation mindset? Mm -hmm know how to accept the situation as it is and without getting all panicked just accept it and then respond to it from an intuitive place what a wonderful skill they would have um, so that's one of the skill sets i i think leaders have to be trained in mm -hmm. i think they also have to learn how to you can call it trust their intuition more um, you know we have a society that's bent on making decisions rationally and logically We've given up this ability to listen to the heart. Uh, Francis talked about the New Zealand premier who is making decisions based on empathy and compassion and caring for the whole and, and a sense of connection to the people. Well, I think that's another skill set people, uh, leaders need to have. Yeah. But we don't train them and we put them in this environment that demands these other skills. And so we have to kind of work both sides of the situation to help leaders become the kind of leaders that we need. Yeah, I love that, Norman, that, that idea of being able to sort of think more organically, I guess, and on the fly, intuitively. I think it's, that is a skill set that is often played down. In fact, people would probably would want, not want to own the sort of a gut instinct on things as much as they want to follow data. But sometimes I think you do need to have that skill of being able to interpret a room or interpret a situation. And I think that comes back to a relatability that a lot of leaders have lost that relatability from the people who work for them and and so the inspiration that they may be able to deliver is lost in translation because they can't relate to either their their situation their environment how you know then it may not be connected in the same way and and i think we're also going into this sort of a hybrid time right now where the multidisciplinary function of businesses we're not sort of in these little narrow silos anymore and so when I'm working with a lot of leaders in my role, often they're so over-indexed by their own sector that they can't see anything beyond the adjacent industries or just beyond where they are operating. There's a whole new world emerging and, and digitization is a great example. But if you're, if you're sitting in the middle of a telco, for example, in a, a telecommunications company, and all you're doing is watching every other telco and seeing what they're doing and looking for a strategic you know, advantage over what they're doing, you know, I think that you miss the opportunity to do something that is actually devi deviating away from the competitor to do something very different, which may involve partnerships or it may involve, you know, broadening out or bringing about just dis different disciplines. And that feeds for me into that whole diversity argument, which is so strong and it not, not necessarily just diversity on gender and age, but actually the multidisciplinary fields that need to come together to solve problems. And, and I certainly am a huge believer that the most diverse group of people you can put together you know from from a sort of a very technical through to very creative groups and you nurture the ability to bubble ideas up from those people that group of people uh, are so much stronger than having people from the same field but actually our, often our organizations we employ people from the same graduate schools we employ people from the same backgrounds often they're the mm. same age group and then we under you know then we question why they haven't been able to find solutions and I think that's another leadership um, characteristic that's changed is actually harnessing the best of people. And I always say, you know, the, 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 the best talent in the room is the room. 
it's everybody collectively it's mm -hmm. not one individual and how do you bring that together as a leader and and hear the voices of many and translate it into one comprehensive solution uh, it's quite a skill yeah, I, I agree francis the I, I often talk about it as uh, taking that whole diversity issue um how can we embrace those that have a completely different point of view than we do right which is another way of saying how can we embrace the conflict we experience in life because yeah. right i mean one of the things that gets us into you know various biases and you know, we listen to a, a narrow set of opinions uh, and especially in business like you said we everybody comes out of the same graduate school and we're we're all part of the same club and we all think the same way and we're all the same color and and so forth and uh boy that's a death knell uh, you know I, I loved i loved your comment about the um staying you know like telcos only look at other telcos right mm. and if you think of two industries the hotel industry and the taxi cab industry who just looked at the company right boy were they ever disrupted with with airbnb and and uber and lyft right mm. people are going to come out at, at leaders and companies and industries from directions we've never thought about uh, technology is enabling things to change and uh so that's it you know we we didn't even need COVID to teach us that we yeah. couldn't stay in a, a more traditional way of thinking um because we were getting signs of this kind of of this need for you know, over over two decades now yeah. uh, but people are just now beginning to recognize more and more uh that yeah, I think it's fascinating. Uh, yesterday, you may have read that Oxford came out, Oxford University, saying that they're going to keep everything online for the next year and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, and this idea of higher education being rapidly disrupted, and for so long they've looked to each other, and they've maintained the status quo of a traditional lecture mm -hmm. theatre and people showing up in a campus life, and there's always been this sort of a pushback against online learning, and and suddenly you have the whole world learning online. Mm -hmm and meeting and interacting. And I, I think a, a, a variation of that for the two worlds, this, you know, this, again, this hybrid state will come out of it. Mm -hmm. But how long people have fought some of these changes that we've, we've rolled out rapidly and actually people have enjoyed. And, and the other one, of course, is working remotely, I think is another one which <laughs> yeah. is gonna change so many sectors that you know, so many things we rely on that people will turn up at nine and finish work at five and mm -hmm. they'll move together and, you know, almost in unison between transport and restaurants and cafes and and just there's so much that's built around that kind of industrial model and almost in a period of two or three months we've just it's blown apart and you know it's changing Crazy. yeah you know and, and i was also thinking about when you were talking about uh, how technology is changing in oxford i was just talking to a friend of mine the other day and he was telling me that uh, his children won't be going back to school. The school is going to stay closed for the rest of the year, and they're going to teach the classes in the fall online. And, we may, and, and I said, well, what grade is your child in? Sixth grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so just imagine a whole generation of, of young people coming up through, the, through life who are so used to online learning yeah. and interacting this way with, with their classmates. Um, who knows what that's going to predict about the future right? yeah. um, and just think about what we're doing right now here's an here's a, uh, a round, round table conversation mm -hmm. from new zealand portland oregon and japan yeah, <laughs> exactly it's, well, it's, and i'm curious if we build on this idea how do you think leadership uh can really manage this shift especially into a more technology driven uh technology augmented reality where we we still need that human to human connection and interaction um you know keeping people together and teams together a lot of times it's about being in the same room and how can leadership manage that properly because it is a rapid change for a lot of leaders and it's not something that's going to go away right it's going to be the more norm now we know that um so what are your thoughts on that yeah i'd like to jump in on that because yeah. um I met my partner who's in charge of our business development function three years ago, and I met him on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. In the last three years, we have met in person once. Oh. I, I, isn't that amazing? Yeah. yeah he's, he's my business partner. And, and it, it, somebody asked me about that. And when I told them how we met and how we've been working together, they go, it, it was like 
wow, really? But to me and my partner, Vitaly, it's, it's quite natural. I mean, we meet once a week, we have conversations. We have some very deep personal conversations about what we call context. Who are we being while we're doing what we're doing? Mm -hmm. How is our beingness affecting our, our outcomes? And so that takes us into some deep conversations uh, and some real vulnerability, which most people think you need to be in person for. So I just share that as one example of, uh, of where the future might lie. I know that I know we're used to being in, in connection in person. I don't think we'll, I think we'll find ways to do that. And I think when we come together in person, we'll make more use of that time. We won't take it so frivolously, like that's just what we do. It's going to be special times. Uh, that's what, that's just, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm prognosticating now. Yeah. I'm trying to be a prophet <laughs> of the future. I have absolutely no idea whether that's actually going to happen, but yeah. it, it seems to me that leaders will find ways. And this goes back to, again, the skill set, what, what Francis was saying earlier, what we call leading from the heart. You know, the mind is important, but without compassion, without empathy, without that ability to just drop into that space where I can connect with another human being, whether I'm on Zoom or in person, it's going to, that's the skill we need to, to, to learn. It's also the place where we get our intuitions and our insight. And so it's, it's got a multiple benefit, uh, as Francis was pointing out earlier. Yeah, if I use uh, my own work environment, um, so we've just come out of seven weeks of lockdown and we are week one back in the office. So everything's now open again. And there was initially when people were in lockdown, there was the, the honeymoon period where everybody was like, oh, this is so great. And people were you know, working to their own body rhythm in terms of the hours they worked the day and working around children and animals and other commitments. And as time went on, and I'm sure many people around the world experienced the desirability of being um, locked in uh, became less and less appealing. And actually, the, the, the constant video chat became very exhausting because you don't get the energy back from the person on the other, other side. And so when we opened the doors this week and people returned, um, there was so much excitement about <laughs> being together again. But the very first uh, conversation we had as a group, we got all got together, still social distancing in the environment, but actually we talked about how we're going to work in the future. And everybody had a slightly different view, but unanimously everybody agreed that nobody was going to come to the office every day. That was that, mm. that time had gone. And some people were you know, thinking about having sh longer, fewer days of the week. Some people were saying, I'll come into the office once or twice a week, but making sure that when they do come together, in our case, we're also a graduate school, so making sure they're here for the students, but actually all the prep and research would be done remotely. Um, one, to miss the traffic, two, to, to actually continue the benefit of having time with their families and enjoying mm. your home space. But the idea of just coming in and sitting quietly by yourself seemed a little bit frivolous, a little bit <laughs> <laughs> pointless. So I think that I do think that people will start to really value those interactions. But that does drive into that conversation around automation, because I think what we are going to see is to fill the gaps between people coming together the digitization automation of systems and processes are going to be really required to be kind of beefed up. And mm. uh, we're certainly seeing it here as a priority. And if you, if you think about the, the combination of the things that people probably don't enjoy that much, I think will be digitized at a much faster speed than ever before, mm. which gives us more time to be human, which means to be mm -hmm. creative and to have conversations and long dialogue and to research and to, and to experiment and to do those great creative and innovative processes, which we had so little time to do. So I'm, I'm absolutely the optimist that we will learn quite rapidly to automate the things people don't really enjoy that much, but we will find more time, which gives us time to problem solve because we'll come together with meaning. And, and not, hmm. not about, um, I think one of the things that I've learned uh, through many conversations in the last few months is rewarding people to be idle, which often happens in a nine to five job, you know, people do their job, they've finished it, they've, they've performed well, and now they stay there because the clock says it's three o'clock. <laughs> Actually, rewarding idleness is probably the most um, disheartening thing you can do to a, for a person, particularly somebody who is, you know, aspirational and smart and wants to can continue to learn and adapt as a human being. And then they're, they're stuck there because the clock is stuck on a time that doesn't mm. say go home. Um, I think that's hopefully a day that, that time has now passed. 
I love your concept yeah. of rewarding the idle. Yeah. I, I've never thought of it in that particular phraseology, but it's so true. I, I also think that that um, we're gonna we're gonna be forced into adopting new organizational ways of working, new structures. Yeah. There's been a big push uh, over the last few years, uh, five years or so, around agile or self-managing teams, uh, and I think we're going to be forced into that because people are going to be working at home. So you can't be supervising them the same way. You can't be on top of them. You can't be having them just sit in the office. So I know that putting in their time, I mean, we're going to be working on, you know, people are going to have to learn how to step up and be responsible for the and accountable for the work they're supposed to do, how they're going to contribute to the collective. And then we're going to let them do it the way they organize their time and their day to do it. And, it just be just like I have a commitment to my wife, I have a commitment to my kids, I have a commitment to my my coworkers, I have a commitment, and I, and I'll learn to balance all of that. I think it'll also address some of the issues about work-life balance, which I think has been a, just that whole phraseology has always bothered me. It means like my work is over here and my life is over here, and and mm. now I got to balance them. Well. How do I become two different people? You know, it's just silly. Uh, I think this is going to help unite the fact that we just live. It's mm -hmm. just life. Yeah. And being a father, being a husband, being a, a son, being a, a brother and a sister and a coworker, I'm all those things. And it's just going to be life. Yeah. So I think these are the changes that this, this change in the way we work is going to start to show up and, and address some of the issues that can't be addressed thinking of it how do i make myself a worker and then mm. all the other parts of my life you know we uh yeah i think i think we're going to see some really good things i'm like francis i'm very optimistic actually norman i think what's been interesting having so much of our time been on video conference recently is i think we've seen into people's home lives you know we've mm. seen them with their kids and their dogs on their laps <laughs> we've seen things falling over and people eating their lunch and you know i think that has actually really dissolved a lot of those you know, home life, you know, work life, hmm. I should say, um, barriers because, you know, we're looking into people's lives in a different way. And I think we've really enjoyed it. We're suddenly seeing, and even the casual, you know, people be more casual in their attire hmm. and not necessarily making, you know, dressing up for the office. Right. And I, think, <laughs> I think it's really dissolved a lot of those hierarchies and expectations yes. and, and perhaps ego that goes with the, the perfect world. Yeah. And suddenly, like you realize that you know people have chaos in their lives, even when they come across as being perfectly, you know, coming across organized all the time. And and I think chaos is a good thing that, that absolutely people become more relatable. I think it's. <laughs> no, I hadn't thought about it, but what you said is very true. You know, I think yeah. about some of the people I've seen on Zoom and some, you know, uh, executives and you know CEOs of big companies and. You know, here they are in the gym shorts, you know, or the sweats, and they're, and they're in their home environment. And it's like, oh, you're just another human being, just like I am. You know, <laughs> taking away all the all the um, symbols of his power, mm. and he's just another human being. And I think that, that that's an interesting observation, Francis. I think you're very right. And she, I've just come off a call with the chief sustainability officer of a large organization, and um, and never met before. And he was sitting on his child's bed, surrounded by soft toys. So we had a one hour conversation. And he said, I'm really sorry, but this is the only room right now that's quiet. It's literally surrounded with big TV it was <laughs> So, you know, I, I think those sorts of uh, sites um, just make people more human anyhow. I just, I just think there's a mm. lovely element. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, great, I wanna um, wrap up here and be respectful of time. And so as a, a kind of a final question is any, any final thoughts uh, after this conversation? So I'll start with Norman. Um, I, I, think, I think like we, we talked about, my, my sense of the future is one of optimism. I think there's going to be a lot of changes. And so people are going to be uncomfortable for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, I think emotions, um, you know, when we experience change, uh, there's actually a death process going on. And so with all death processes, there's a grieving period. And we, people have to be allowed to have that sense of loss and the grieving for that sense of loss. Uh, and I think collectively as a society, as a world, 
Uh, so many people are going to be experiencing that. And I think, again, here's a place for leaders to have a sense of compassion for what the people, as well as themselves, are going through. I mean, as we said, we joked about leaders being in the kids' room with all sorts of fluffy, <laughs> and they don't have their power symbols. I mean, that's that's going to be hard for leaders, too. So we're all going to be going through a period here um, uh, of some sort of grieving sense of loss, and compassion would be a, a wonderful trait to bring forward. And Francis? And I think I absolutely agree with Norman. And I think the other side of that is what COVID particularly has, has taught many, and including myself, is the, the vulnerability of three people, three different groups of people, the elderly, yeah. who obviously were most, have been really impacted. Yeah. Um, the frontline workers who are you know, actually doing extraordinary work and for very little return in many cases. And I think the other group is those who are not educated and yeah. you know having little choice right now. And so yeah. and I think equity and equality uh, are going to become really important. Looking across our organisations, particularly very large organisations who have workforces that are diverse from you know, factory workers and people doing quite mundane work right through to executives, actually understanding that we can't continue to lead with this view that the top tier get all the all the benefit and it doesn't trickle down through the whole organisation. Mm. And I think there's going to be an accountability expectation as leaders to say, what are you doing for, for the most vulnerable in your organisation? And watching the loss of jobs and how that's going to impact on some families and particularly in some communities. I think we are going to have to be really mindful of the impact that's going to have on the whole economy globally. If we mm. don't get people back on track into good employment and actually feel safe and able to develop a capability that is relevant for the time, but also moving them up the ecosystem and supporting them. And that may mean some huge compromises for people who've been used to some, some great perks and luxuries of life. Um, but I think the leaders who continue on as though nothing has changed will get a rude awakening by the people who work for them and they'll choose to walk with their feet and go somewhere else um, to those who are, you know, are thinking more equitably across organizations. Um, and final question, the most difficult question is, um, what is one word that you would like to leave as kind of a, a summary for future intelligent leadership? So one word. I'll start with Norman. Love. Love. Francis. And I'll go, with, I'll go with hope. Hope. Great. Well, thank you, Norman and Francis, for joining me on this episode today. I really appreciate your time, your energy, your insights, and your wisdom. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you for joining us today on the Flowcast. To get a summary of today's dialogue, find out more about today's guests, listen to previous episodes, or discover more about Haku Global's neuroscience-based Futures Intelligent Leadership programs or customized strategic foresight and innovation sprints, visit us at www.haku.global. At Haku Global, we believe it is time for more Futures Intelligent Leadership. The future is something we need to think more intelligently and feel more deeply about so we can collaborate to discover today's solutions for future problems. If you are in a leadership role and need support or training to scale futures intelligence across your organization, then contact us at Haku Global. This is your host, Tyler Mongan, and until next time, have a preferred and conscious future. Aloha.